What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Headphones New Reviews and the second part in my two-part series of episodes called Old is New. So for this review is going to be um, mostly Star Trek focused just to, because I'm starting off with a follow-up from last week's episode but then I'm going to round out the, the end of the episode with a, rev or a set of reviews that are coming for the next couple of weeks. Um, the section that's in today's episode is going to kind of be a precursor prelude to what's coming up. So I'll get to that when I get there. And then there'll be a few bits of updates in the middle um, of the episode for just regular reviews and stuff like that. So to start it off um, with the finale of Star Trek Picard Season 3 being all about the Borg, I decided to go back and rewatch the Borg episodes from Star Trek The Next Generation just to see if they hold up to my memory of it, how they are, and see if I can get a general theme of what happened in those episodes. So this covers and includes the Season 1 Episode 26 episode, The Neutral Zone, which does not necessarily, or it doesn't actually include any Borg, but reading online, it's supposed to be uh, an episode that precludes or preludes the meeting with the Borg as a mysterious um, set of beings or culture or people that are causing damage. There's no defense against them and no, we don't see them. Um, I want to assume after seeing the episode, because the technology and people that are part of the Federation, these science outposts out in the middle of nowhere, do not have anything to add to the Borg Collective. So the, they come in, they attack, they move on because there's nothing that can be contributed. And then we're fast forwarded and thrust into the conflict with an initial conflict of the Borg because of Q's actions in the season two episode, Q Who. And then the initial part of this episode is rounded out in what I can, I want to say is a good trilogy of episodes because the Borg now make it into Federation space. And then we get the two part episodes of the best of both worlds where uh, Picard is captured by the Borg, becomes Locutus and is ended up being saved from the Borg by the crew. Um, I didn't see any of the episodes that had some of his re residual side effects of being saved from the Borg because he can still hear them. Um, he has no love for them because of what they do. He knows everything that they did and what they're capable of. But we kind of see his bias in the episode called I Borg when it comes to, in relation to Hugh. Uh, why he has little love but the, for the Borg but then also... The, his humanity of being a Starfleet officer kicks in and all of that. Um, and then I, Borg, is rounded out with two more episodes called De in the Season 6 finale and Season 7 premiere, Descent, because the Borg that are being saved as a result of the Borg cube being destroyed um, are now being led by Lore, Data's brother, and um, that was a matter of um, Lore being opportunistic to uh, rule them where part of the um, fault lies on the side of the Federation that they didn't really deal with how they're going to help the Borg reacclimate to not having the collective voice in their head and how they can lead themselves. So they went to the first person who could promise them um, some semblance of their old life with the Borg, but then also being free of the Borg. So um, it's a good set of episodes in that we don't know much about the Borg, but then we now have to, or we not don't know much about the Borg, we learn about them, and then we have to deal with the aftermath of um, the repercussions of, you know, Picard not being part of them anymore, but then also saving other people who are not Borg either. Um, so as far as initial, an initial set of um, dealing with the Borg, these sets of episodes are very good. It deals with a lot of, you know, ethical concerns, personal concerns, um, saving, you know, the crew saving their captain and their friend and all of that. So if nothing else, I would always say if you want to have a good episode arc of the Borg, definitely watch these. Go in and watch the Star Trek Voyager episodes related to the Borg, um, the saving and redemption of Seven of Nine, and then go into Picard Season 3 because it's some of the best Star Trek episodes um, out there as far as the Borg thread, dealing with them. They're um, thinking they're they're defeated and then they're coming back and then somewhere in the middle of all that watch Star Trek First Contact because you get a nice little prequel as to the start of how humanity got, 
develop their warp engines, Bo the Borg going back in time and dealing with that. So, on, and even on the flip side, it, it's a good summary of the entire stor Borg story arc because you get to deal with Picard having to talk to the uh, the lady, um, Cochrane's right hand lady, um, about the Federation being better, but he's still a human kind of thing. So. Even if you just watch The Best of Both Worlds and then First Contact, that's a good set of episodes related to the Borg. Um, so part of me wants to say I'm kind of hoping that we're now finally done with the Borg because the Borg cube in Picard is destroyed. But um, I kind of want to also have, deal, see more about their culture and their far-reaching impact. Um, I think a lot of that happened in Star Trek Voyager, but... Um, I wouldn't mind a little bit more about that sort of stuff, um, or even like a you know, for example, a mini series about the Borg, um, with them going around how they the it comes into conclusion like how they decided on a cube instead of a sphere and the creation and the growth and all of that as far as a Borg society goes. Um, but that being said, I'll now I'm not going to move into the rest of this um, um, this episode, but. I recommend the, the Borg episodes. I'll have all them all listed in the show notes if you do want to give them a watch. The Neutral Zone is kind of optional, but if you take it under the microso or microscope of... It's the introduction of the Borg threat, even though we don't know it's a Borg. It sets up the rest of the episodes very nicely. Um, so with that being said, um, I did have a chance to watch Star Wars Vision Season 2. And overall, it was a decent season... For the most part, there were not a lot of episodes that were that I felt were for me. They were more on the childish, amateurish anime side of things. So, granted, they're Star Wars, and it was good to have that kind of a visual design. But for me, the two episodes that stood out were the initial one called Sith, I think, or just Sith, and it deals with a painter lady who's having trouble finishing a painting. She deal, and then she has to fight with her old Sith master because she, which I guess she gave up the Force, and. In the battle, she realizes that her painting needed the dark side of the force to complete it, to have that balance in her painting. And because she's defeated her master, is now the uh, Jedi or force-using master of her own, so she can now move on to bigger and better things. And then the other episode that I liked was the Ronin uh, samurai-style episode, which was very well done. You have It's kind of like the Seven Samurai-style episode, so... I definitely recommend watching that one as well if you want if you are a fan of you know films like Seven Samurai or like that kind of episode from the first season then definitely check that one out as well but I don't really have much too much to say about it for the most part it was you know good animations think along the lines of like Star Wars Rebels kind of thing but on a more or more geared to a younger audience the two episodes I liked were geared more towards the older audience so that is why I think I liked those a little bit more. So with that being said, um, I was originally just going to base my Android segment this week on Nova Launcher, but because we got the announcement for the Google Pixel Fold, I thought I would talk a little bit about that or give at least my initial impressions without having actually felt it and seen it in person. Um, based on the specs, you know, 128 megapixel camera, the same camera sensors as the Pixel phones. Um, I think it's a 7.0-inch display unfolded, and I think 5.8 inches folded. Don't quote me on that, but I'm trying to, as I'm going off memory, I don't remember the storage space, but overall it looks pretty good from the pictures and the, you know, watching it on a video and a live stream and all that. So overall it does look like it's worth buying. The only downside is the price point at, I think is like starting at $1,800. So the biggest issue I have there is that price point because for that, that price point you can get a Samsung Galaxy Fold. I think it's, I forget if it's a Galaxy Fold or the Z Fold for around that price point as well. So it becomes a matter of do you want a vanilla Android experience or the Galaxy experience? And then for me too, it also comes down to what are the specs on the two um, devices um, and which one is better or worse than the other. But um I know for me, ideally, a price point of maybe something closer to $1,000 would be better. Um, but we'll see how that all works itself out. Because the Folds are a new um, type of phone, Is probably I think that's where all the 
money is going into is the cost of developing a folding phone. But to that point, Android 14 does better support foldable devices, so I expect to see more of those um, in the near future. But for all intents and purposes, at an initial look, it does look like a good device. So, you know, if you're looking to spend that kind of money anyways on a folding device, and if you're like me, prefer a more vanilla Android experience, then the Galaxy Pixel Fold may be the way to go for you. Um, and then we had other announcements, um, a lot more stuff on AI stuff, the, or the AI endeavors that Google is doing. I think Google Bard is now out of private beta, and it can now be used by anyone via the public beta. Uh, we got the Pixel 7a, which I think is a lighter weight Pixel 7 and things like that. So uh, not too much there. Just I, from what I could tell, the focus on the this year's Google I.O. was on AI. So look for a lot more of that sort of integration on your Android smartphones and various Google apps in the near future. But with that being said, um, I still wanted to talk about Nova Launcher because let's say you're on an Android device that's not a Pixel, not OnePlus, um, where you don't have that kind of bare bones minimalistic UI, but you want to have a more customizable home screen. And this goes on the Pixel and OnePlus devices as well, but let's say you want to change up your home screen. You, you like a very particular um, weather widget, but you don't like how it crops the widget down to the to not to not cover the full home screen that's where nova launcher shines because you can have a widget that has borders but then let's say you want to have an edge to edge widget display like with weather with weather widgets or various other widgets that you may use nova launcher lets you do that so you use up more real screen real estate you can set up your own home screen grid so instead of a four by four layout or four by six you can do something like seven by ten so you can have seven apps wide and seven row or seven columns and uh, 10 rows so you can fit a lot more apps on your home screen um, you have a little bit more granularity on that grid as far as fitting widgets and icons together um, you can turn your dock on and off so if you just want a home screen without a dock you can do that you can set your dock to have one through seven icons on it instead of the default four or five so nova launcher is a very customizable way to have a home screen that is tailored to you and fits your particular set of app usage. Um, it is also nice because you, uh, it gives you more um, gesture support as well. So it does support, you know, double tapping the lock, but if you want to hold and drag, um, triple tap, uh, change your home screen button from just going home to opening a particular app, then you can do that. Um, if you um, install the beta version, beta 8, then you get the material you theming based on your wallpaper. So it has all these sorts of different options in a very easy to use settings menu. So you're not, ne you're not um, stuck on using um, one particular uh, set of grid icons or a particular look that's set by your phone manufacturer. You can customize your UI to how you want your home screen to look. So I definitely recommend checking it out. Um, it is available for free in the Google Play Store with very minimal things not included, like all gestures are not there. Um, and certain other random things are not included, but if you go with the Pro version, everything is unlocked. You get regular support, so it's updated pretty regularly up until recently when the um, when the app was bought out by another company, but they did, they are still developing the beta version of version eight with a material you theming. So look out for that coming soon. Um, there, and granted there are a number of launchers out there on the, um, the Google Play Store to use. So you have, you know, LaunchShare Launcher, uh, Square Home Launcher and many others. But if you want a customizable uh, launcher that's easy to use, for me, Nova Launcher has generally been that consistent launcher to go back to. So with that being said, um, next up and more for a personal note, but something I wanted to review to continue with the whole thing of recommending apps on Linux to use. So let's say you've wanted to get into uh, video editing or you have to, you want to, you know, uh, stream a few different videos together that are all part of, um, uh, a vacation video or and I'm gonna assume that you can or you can you can also let's say you want to create your own uh, video slideshow in a in a video format then 
there's an open source program called KDEN Live. That's K D E N L I V E that lets you do just that. So let's say you want to create a photo slideshow with transitions. Uh, you have your own background music that you sing and you want to put that behind it. Then Kden Live will let you do that and then um, export it in a video that you can upload to you know YouTube or share on you know WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or whatever you know on social media. Um, and you can do the same thing with video. So let's say you have a set of vacation videos that you want to share but you would rather have it all in one long video, then you can use KDEN Live to import the videos, uh, set up transitions. Um, if you want to add some commentary, then once you set up that string of videos, in the preview, uh, you have a live preview that you can have the preview so that set up your recording and import that so that you can time the voiceover narration with the videos that the people are watching. You can do a little bit of time shifting so, you know, if you started recording a little bit before this audio starts, you can do that. If you want to move your audio over to the right a little bit to coincide with the video, then have a little bit of an intro, that's an option. Um, you can set up title cards, um, transition titles, fade in and out, and all sorts of different things. And export the videos in up to 4K 60 frames per second. So you have a lot of customizability in an open source app. Um, it is available for Windows, Linux, and uh, Mac. So let's say you are on a tight budget, you don't necessarily want to buy a full-fledged video editing program, then I recommend KDEN Live. And I'm saying this from personal experience because, you, as you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, I haven't been doing any sorts of um, title cards or you don't get, there's not the same background audio like on the, audio, on the podcast file. So... I've been slowly starting to learn how to do all that stuff, finding a good program to use. I'm on an older laptop, so I'm limited by my hardware or my system requirements for apps. And Kden Live works perfectly. So it lets me import files. I preview things at 720p, so I'm not. It's not you know staticky as far as resource usage goes and all that. Exporting does take some time. I think I want to say. Uh, 20 to 30 minute video takes about 45 minutes to an hour to export after editing but when I'm when I am doing the editing everything works very very smoothly so it is a very stable program it works on older and newer hardware and lets you do that photo editing regardless of your experience um, it does take a little bit of time to get used to it but if you have used audio editing software on the open source side like audacity then you'll generally feel at home with Kden Live because essentially all it's doing is adding the video component that Audacity does not have. So um, as of this recording, I definitely recommend it. And I will say that coming soon, depending on personal timing because of other training I'm in, that I'm going to start adding that um, um, video recording, a bit, uh, edited videos with you know background audio and title cards and all of that so you get a similar experience on the on the video version as you do on the podcast version. So with that being said, the rest of the episode is going to generally be just um, general updates of stuff that I've been up to, kind of like Kden Live, but I did have a chance to play Assassin's Creed Origins a little bit more this week. I think last week I was a bit busy just because of Star Trek Picard, some training and uh, work timing throwing me off. But I did have a chance to finish or continue this week on Assassin's Creed Origins. I got through the Alexandria uh, level, I think. So now I'm into the grander scheme of the game where I'm now, or my character is now working for Cleopatra to help her regain the throne. Um, we learned that the group that's a bit, that's the cause of the death of your main character and his wife's son's death is part of a larger evil nefarious organization so now you're tasked with taking out the taking down the rest of the organization so the game has definitely gotten a lot more interesting so look out for those gameplay videos um as well but i had a chance to play a little bit more now um but with that being said, I actually also wanted to give an update for reviews that are coming for the next couple of weeks. I'm hoping to be done in two weeks, but I'm, I am going to split up the reviews a little bit in that I started watching the episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine that are related to the Dominion War. So 
the reason I wanted to do this is because they did drop a line in Star Trek season, or Picard Season 3 about the Dominion War being an interesting conflict or something like that. And then I got to thinking that while I have seen some episodes of Deep Space Nine, I didn't actually know that the bulk of it was related to the Dominion War and that they had shifted over the course of time over to focusing on that. So because I had not seen that story arc, I don't know what's going on, I thought I would watch the core episodes related to the Dominion War. So the past week or so, I've been looking at various lists online as far as finding out which episodes to watch. And I think I've come down with a good list of episodes to do just that. So um, from season two, episode 26, the Jem Hadar, that's a starting point for the Dominion. We're introduced to their warriors, of the, called the Jem'Hadar, the Dominion, their general personality, and how they, their society is on a broad general scale. And then in episode 5, notice, notably episodes 14, uh, In Purgatory Shadow, and episode 15, By Inferno's Light, and then the season 5 finale, Call to Arms, that is the buildup of the tension between the Federation and the Dominion because they're on opposite ends of the wormhole. And then you start to have different team-ups, so the Federation is teaming up with the Bajorans and the Klingons, and then the Cardassians are split as far as those who follow Goldacott, who are teaming up with the Dominion, and then I guess others are going to team up with the Federation. So by the time you get through the end of Season 5, you have your different battle lines. Um, and then near as I can tell, Season 6 deals with the... Um, occupation of the Dominion in at Deep Space Nine and then season seven deals with the take back of Deep Space Nine and the defeat of the Dominion. So um, I've gotten through Call to Arms and so I'm hoping by next week's episode I'll have se the season six episodes completed to review that portion of it and then I'm going to probably have to split up season seven into the episodes prior to the final arc. So like the first few seasons in the first half deal with, I guess, how the resistance and then episode 17 through 26 is a final arc. So depending on how fast I'm able to watch the episodes, I figure in two to three weeks I'll be completely done. But uh, whichever episodes I watch each week, I'm going to do that review as far as how far I've gotten, what I think, what um, how basically a progress update to share where I'm at and what I think of this bat the battle so far and then by the time I finish I'll do an overall review of the Dominion War. So with that being said that's all for this particular episode so if you have any questions comment feedback or anything like that you can comment on this post uh, um, on any of the social media sites I'm on uh, they're all linked on the website at headphonesneal.reviews for video versions of the podcast as well as gameplay um our gameplay video updates be sure to check out the youtube channel at youtube.com slash patel n01 the website also has links to uh, support the show past episodes subscription links and all of that good stuff um, if you're a patron of the show then you get early access to the podcast along with an ad free version of each episode which is at patreon.com slash patel n01 but that is all for this particular episode thanks for tuning in and until next time